Hello, I'm Dale Gentry, and welcome to the Disciple Science Podcast. I am an ecologist and a Christian. I find great joy and harmony in my life exploring science, studying birds, and in following Jesus. I started Disciple Science to help people connect with God through nature. I'm glad you are here to join me and occasional guests as we explore the intersection of science and Christian faith. Now, let's get on with the podcast. On this episode, I had the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Catherine Hayhoe. At this point, Dr. Hayhoe likely needs no introduction, but I'll provide one all the same. She is an atmospheric scientist and a professor at Texas Tech University. She has been named one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People, Foreign Policy's 100 Leading Global Thinkers, and one of Politico's 50 Thinkers, Doers, and Visionaries Transforming American Politics. Catherine was recently named the Chief Scientist for the Nature Conservancy, and she has been a lead author for the National Climate Assessment and she produces a PBS Digital Studios short series called Global Weirding that you can find on YouTube. Today, we'll be talking about her forthcoming book, which is about to hit bookstore shelves called Saving Us, a climate scientist case for hope and healing in a divided world. Lastly, before you hear the interview, I want to mention that Disciple Science is partnering with Arosha USA to host a four-week book club that will include a webinar with Dr. Hayhoe this fall. You can sign up for free at loveyourplace.org. I'll put a link in the show notes, so make sure you check it out. All right, well, we are uh, honored today to welcome Dr. Catherine Hayhoe to the Disciple Science Podcast. We're so uh, glad to have you here to talk about your new book, Saving Us and uh, all that you have learned about what's going on with climate change and the Christian community in the recent past. Thank you for having me. Sure, it's, a, it's great to have you here. I just wanna kind of start on the same page. You know, uh, we are in agreement that climate change is, is real, that it is very serious and that it's caused by humans. And it seems like we're at a place now where we're wanting to move past the question of if it's happening and start thinking about what to do about it and um, and how to get everybody else on board with that. Now you play this critical role of sharing a worldview with the group of Americans that are most skeptical, which are white evangelical Christians. And um, we know from research that that um, people tend to trust information that they get from people that share their their worldview, and so you have been so gracious to to be that ambassador to talk about climate change. And so I, I thought we could just start about why why is it that um, that white evangelicals tend to be so skeptical when we compare them to other social groups? Yes, I would add that the second most skeptical group are white Catholics. Oh, wow. But the most concerned group, when you look at different religious denominations or affiliations, are not those who are unaffiliated. The most concerned group are Hispanic Catholics. And there you start to see the breakdown. You're like, okay, Mm -hmm. same Pope. Yes. (laughs) Maybe even some of the same churches. Check. Same, you know, same religious beliefs. So what is going on? It turns out that it is not where we go to church or where we don't go to church on a Sunday or a Saturday or any other day of the week. It is not that that predicts our opinions on climate change. Mm -hmm. Rather, that is a consequence of the fact that the United States is now more politically polarized than it has been in decades. People are more divided now on all kinds of different issues than they have been in any time in the recent past. And of all those politically polarized issues, like race and immigration and, um, you know, uh, all these different issues that people debate politically, of all of those issues, you know which one's most politicized? Climate change. It is number one. It is the issue on which the most people disagree for political reasons. So where do evangelicals, where do Catholics come into the mix? It turns out that over the past 40, 50 years in the US, there has been concerted and deliberate efforts to affiliate and associate theologically conservative Christians 
with politically conservative parties. Mm -hmm. It's something that Billy Graham actually warned about decades ago. He said, watch out for the right wing. They don't want to actually help you. They want to use you. Mm -hmm. Yet that was exactly what's happened. And it's gotten to the point now where, unfortunately, for many people, their statement of faith or statement of belief is written primarily by their political ideology and only a distant second by the Bible. And if the two come into conflict, they will go with political ideology over the Bible and right. slap a Christian sticker on the cover. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That's, I mean, well, so then is it, and I've, I've heard you talk about this before, then but but what, why the conservatives? Why you know what, is it their concern about um, the policies, or is it something to do inherent with environmental concern in general? Mm -hmm. um, why, why are the conservatives tending to be more more skeptical of this issue? Well, that's another very good question because the very word conservative means to conserve, right? Yeah, it did. <laughs> so, if you are truly conservative, and I know many conservatives who actually argue this, rightly, sure. if right. you are truly conservative, would you not want to conserve our water, to conserve our air, to conserve our natural resources, to conserve and protect all of the amazing gifts that God has given us in creation and in nature? And in the past, going back through the history of the United States, there absolutely have been conservative politicians who have wanted to conserve. They have truly been conservatives in the original root sense of the word, as well as politically. But somehow, again, over the last few decades, conservative has gotten skewed to the opposite end of the spectrum, where it's all about being wasteful, being a profligate with our resources, with not conserving our resources. Right. And how did all of that happen? <laughs> well, that's, that's something that a lot of people look into in detail. And there's a really fascinating book by a colleague of mine called Naomi Oreskes called Merchants of Doubt. Yes. Have you probably, yeah. yes. yes. It's, it's a book or it's also a documentary if you just want yep. to watch the documentary. Yep. And it shows, Merchants of Doubt is a great title because it shows how big industries looked at the impacts that their industry was having on the world, whether it was poisoning people through tobacco smoke or through pollution, or whether it was digging up and processing and selling fossil fuels like coal and gas and oil that when we burn them, wrap an extra blanket around the planet, causing the planet to warm. And that's what's driving climate change. Mm -hmm. No matter what big corporation it was, when they found out that their product was doing harm, they made a conscious decision to invest in muddying the waters, in calling into question the basic science, attacking the scientists, and supporting, and in some cases, even flat out purchasing politicians and decision makers to make laws and decisions that favored them. This is all about power and wealth. That's what this whole debate is about. It's about the people who control the balance of power and wealth in this world and who would rather keep it than change their business model so that it actually lives up to the values most of us espouse, which as Christians is to love your neighbor as yourself, yeah. as conservatives to conserve our resources, as yeah. other human beings to care for and have compassion on our brothers and sisters around the world, whether we're Christians or not. The yep. golden rule is kind of a, a very, very basic moral guideline that most people around the world would agree to, yet somehow in our pursuit of money and our pursuit of power, we've lost sight of the fact that what really matters is the well-being of all of us, not that of just a few. Hmm. Yeah, very, very good. Well said. Um, you know, and I I'm curious because you've done a couple of um, career shifts of, of late, and, and I want to ask you about both of them. But one of uh, so you're a, a, a professor at Texas Tech, right? And you were in the atmospheric sciences, but you transitioned into a different department. Is that did you transition to political science because that is the the nature of the debate? It's less about the science and more about uh, politics. Is, was that behind your transition? Well, my first transition was actually as a student. So my undergraduate degree is in astrophysics. Mm -hmm. yep. And I was planning to be an astrophysicist <laughs> when in order to complete my undergraduate degree, I took a, I had to take an extra breadth requirement. And I saw this new cl class on climate change over there that they were just yeah. offering. I thought, well, that looks interesting. And I took it and <laughs> that completely changed my trajectory because that's where I learned for the first time that climate change is not only an environmental issue that environmentalists care about and the rest mm. of us wish them well. Climate change is a human issue. It affects every single one of us on this planet in ways that matter directly to us, our health, 
the health of our children, the safety of the places where we live, uh, the health of our economy, um, the security of our homes and our country, the ability for this planet to provide us with clean air to breathe and clean water to drink and food to eat, which we just take for granted some days until the skies are choked with wildfire smoke and our kids can't even go outside to play for three straight weeks in a row just because the air quality is so bad. We've had that so, in Minnesota this summer. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I was up in Ontario with my family for the first time since the beginning of the pandemic this July and our skies were hazy with smoke, some of it from smoke up on the border between Manitoba and, and Ontario, but some of it from smoke from all the way across to the other side of the country. Right. Yeah. So, so that was my first shift, sort of from, from recognizing that climate change was not just something that those environmental tree huggers worried about. It was something that every single one of us worry about. In fact, the only criteria to worry about climate change, to be concerned about it and to want to fix it, in my opinion, is whether we're a human living on planet Earth. Yeah. And anybody who's listening to this, <laughs> I'm pretty sure they are a human living on planet Earth, so yeah. you qualify. So that was my first shift. But then my second shift was in, when I realized that, you know, we know that climate is changing. We know that humans are responsible. We know the impacts are serious. We've known that for so long that scientists formally warned a U.S. president about the risks of climate change and the need to avert them in 1965. <laughs> that's how long ago we've right. known it. More than 50 years. That's remarkable. More yeah. than 50 years. Well, more, almost 60 now. Yeah. So yes, of course, science matters. Yes, of course, our decisions need to be based off good science. Yes, of course, there's always more to study about this planet, which is as complex as that of the, of the human body. Um, and Yes, the work I do is relevant because I specifically, in terms of my research, I look at the difference between the choices we make. Mm -hmm. So if we decide to reduce our carbon emissions and transition or accelerate the transition to clean energy, what will the world look like in 20, 30 years? If we say, oh, it doesn't matter, let's keep on using fossil fuels, what will that world look like in 20 or 30 years? Yeah. So I'm kind of like the physician who does the scan of somebody's arteries and says, okay, this artery is at 30% blocked. This one's at 82% blocked. Right. Here's what your next 20 years will look like depending <laughs> on the choices that you make. I can't make them for you. It is up to you. You have lifestyle changes to make. You need to look at what you eat. You need to look at how you exercise and move. You need to look at possibly some, some preventative medication, but the choice is up to you. So that's the research I do. Yep. But the reason we're not acting, and this is actually what my new book, Saving Us, is all about, mm -hmm. We're not acting because we lack information on the risks. Mm -hmm. We're not acting because of the psychological barriers, because of the political barriers, because of the social barriers to action. Right. And so now being in a political science department, I moved from the Department of Geosciences at Texas Tech over to the political science department. I'm able to do to continue to do the physical science, which informs those types of decisions in terms of why do our actions matter, but I can also do more of the social science in terms of, well, why aren't we making the right choice? Why are we not acting like that perfect rational human being that the Greek <laughs> philosophers envisioned where you tell people what's gonna happen and they say, well, of course, naturally I will right. do that. Why are we not making good decisions? And there's a ton of research in many fields looking again at diet and exercise and how much money we save for retirement and whether or not we smoke and all of these things where we know the right thing. Yeah. We have ample information, but yeah. we just don't do it. And I'm sorry to say right now, case in point is vaccines. <laughs> Every expert in the yeah. world is saying, get the vaccine. Yep. Francis Collins, who's the head of the National Institutes of Health here, of course, and also um, helped to found BioLogos, mm -hmm. a great Christian organization. He's yes. out there saying, look, I decoded the human genome. I understand how vaccines work and I'm a Christian. Please yep. get the vaccine. And yet we have people often in our own families who just dig in their heels and say, no, does that have anything to do with lack of information about the actual vaccine? No, it has to do with all kinds of other social and ideological and psychological factors. So that's, that's what I think is so fascinating and what I try to unpack in my book. But just this past summer, I made another shift, which was... <laughs> I'm, I'm going to ask you about that too. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Tell us about that. Um, so I just took on a new role in addition to continuing to serve as a professor at Texas Tech University. And in my new role, I am the chief scientist for the Nature Conservancy, mm -hmm. which is the largest global conservation organization in the world. 
Now tell us about that because when I, I mean, I'm a, I'm a conservation biologist. I talk about the nature conservancy all the time. And when I think about nature conservancy, I think of habitat conservation and preservation and efforts to make sure land is set aside, that nature is preserved. What, how is the nature conservancy and, and your role involved in, in climate change? Well, that's exactly the image that I had of the Nature Conservancy too. <laughs> and so when they first came knocking, I was like, I'm, excuse me, I'm a climate scientist. Why are you talking to me again? <laughs> and that's not to say, of course, that climate science doesn't have a place in ecology. I've done many studies looking at how climate change is affecting the spread of invasive species, how it is endangering species, how it's leading to shifts in, in the phenology of many ecosystems and species. There's obviously an intimate connection there. But I'm very focused on the fact that if we don't fix climate change, it will fix us and we will not like that solution. It is not the planet that is at risk. It is us humans and every other living thing on this planet, except probably cockroaches, possums, and very likely deer and raccoons too. <laughs> but everything else, that's what's at risk. And frankly, after the polar bear, we're next. Yeah. Right. We humans are incredibly vulnerable because we've built our entire civilization. We've allocated our agricultural acres. We've parceled out our water. We've drawn our geopolitical boundaries around the tacit assumption of a stable climate. And now climate is changing faster than any time on the history of this planet. Yeah. So when I said to the Nature Conservancy, I said, why me? Why a climate scientist? They said, well, because climate change is our top priority. Yeah. Tackling climate change is at the very top of our list. Yes, we want conserving to nature, yeah. Exactly. We want to protect land. We want to protect water. The reason we do it is because we're humans living on this planet too. And that provides everything that we need for life. We could not survive without yeah. the air and the water and the resources our planet provides. So of course we want a healthy planet. Yeah. And we know that there's no way to get a healthy planet unless we tackle climate change. And mm -hmm. tackling climate change involves working with humans, with human systems, with human economics, with human political systems and decision-making frameworks, with our social systems, with our towns and our cities and our states and our organizations, our businesses too. All of us have to come together to tackle climate change. Yep. And I thought, well, that's exactly the perspective I have too. That's great. Well, congratulations on that new role. Uh, I'm, I'm... I'm also curious how you get it all done, but that's probably a question for another time. <laughs> yeah, you can also wish me some condolences too. <laughs> <laughs> You're right, yeah, probably. Yes. So in your book, you you make, um, uh, you some, share some wonderful stories, some horrifying stories also about the interactions with you have, talking to people about this issue and sometimes, you know, trying to convince them that this is something they should be concerned with. And um you uh, do a good job of at least convincing me to ignore my instinct, which is just to, to clarify the science and reteach them the science and show how it's so clear. Why shouldn't we just do more science and better science and, and help people understand the, the physical nature of the climate change issue? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, obviously the science is important. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, science explains how this world works, how this universe functions. Science says gravity is real. And, and you or I could say, well, I don't believe in gravity and we could step off the cliff. It doesn't matter. We're going down. Mm -hmm. We can say, I don't believe that climate is changing, or I don't believe that humans are responsible. Or we could just say, well, I don't believe it's serious. It doesn't matter what we believe. It is real. It is us. And it is serious. Right. <laughs> so, so absolutely the facts matter. Yep, and yep. for those of us who are scientists, part of what drew us to become scientists in the first place is that shared perspective of those facts are what have to inform our opinions. Yep. As scientists, if we get something wrong, we might not like it. To be totally honest, I don't like getting something wrong. And I tend to kind of hold to what I felt was right. But by definition, as a scientist, we have to be open to the more, more information, more yep. analysis, more data. And yep. if it turns out we were wrong, as a good scientist, we have to change our minds because our opinions are based on the facts, not the facts on our, our opinions. Right. But back in the 1980s, Isaac Asimov said, who of course is a science fiction writer who I think is, is all too prescient today. <laughs> he said, anti-intellectualism, speaking of the United States, wow. has been a constant thread winding its way through our political and cultural life nurtured by the false notion that democracy means that, quote, my ignorance as, is just as good as your knowledge. Wow. 
Yeah. And in 1965, um, an author won the Pulitzer Prize for a book called Anti-Intellectualism in American Life. Mm -hmm. So for some of us, the facts are enough to convince us. But even in our own lives, in some areas, we don't necessarily adhere to the facts in other areas that don't have to do with our science. Right. And we engage in what's called motivated reasoning. And I sort of unpack this in the book, yep. the idea that I've got my opinion first, and then I go out and I look for information that shows that I'm right. 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 And that is really the way all of us humans work. And the internet has made it so much easier because <laughs> all we have to do is Google our opinion. Yeah. And that will pop all kinds of YouTube videos and blogs <laughs> and websites showing why we are right. Right. And this applies to if we think that the earth is flat, it applies to if we think we shouldn't be getting vaccinations or right. that they will alter our DNA such that we cannot get into heaven anymore. <laughs> we can find whatever we think is the case, sadly, yeah. on the internet. Yeah. And no matter what YouTube and Facebook and Twitter think they're doing to reduce information, misinformation, they're not. It's not working, <laughs> it is right? Yeah. Very safe. <laughs> So, so that's why understanding where people are coming from is so important and understanding their objections have nothing to do with the actual science because people who say climate isn't changing and humans aren't responsible, they use refrigerators and stoves and they fly in airplanes. Yeah. What does that have to do with it? Well, it's the very same science. Thermodynamics and nonlinear fluid dynamics is the very same science that explains how our planet is warming, that explains why airplanes fly and why fridges work. Right. So if yeah. they were really consistent, they would be a total Luddite. They wouldn't be using any type of technology <laughs> because it's the same physics, but yeah. they're not. Right. And that there, just as showing, just as talking about how Hispanic and white Catholics are at the opposite end of the spectrum in terms of who cares, that shows why it isn't our theology, even though we use religiously sounding objections, that really explains the denial. Yep. And it isn't our lack of science and information, even though we often hear sciencey sounding objections that really explains the denial. Our denial is primarily solution aversion. We don't want to fix it. But yep. here's the interesting thing. If I say, okay, sure, here's a big problem, but I don't want to fix it. This problem is creating health hazards with wildfire smoke across all of Western North America, but I don't want to fix it. This problem is flooding a third of the entire country of Bangladesh with supersized monsoon rainfalls, but I don't want to fix it. This problem has increased the economic gap between the richest and poorest countries in the world by 25% over the last 50 years, but I don't want to fix it. Right. If we say that, that would make us a bad person yeah. by just about anybody's moral standards, let alone those of a Christian. Yep. And so what our subconscious does, and I really truly believe it's largely our subconscious, mm -hmm. is our subconscious, you know, I'm giving people grace here. For some people, it's cold-blooded, like for the, for the <laughs> big organizations. Willful that, ignorance, like, right, yeah. Yes. For, for some of those big organizations like Exxon, who researched climate change yeah. in the 1970s and made a conscious choice to attack scientists and muddy the waters rather than change their business model, that was conscious. Yeah. But for most of us as individuals, it's truly, it's subconscious because we, our rational goes like this. I'm a good person. I want to be a good person. I have values. I have morals. I have ethics that I act according to. Mm -hmm. So if I don't want to fix this problem, it must mean that there's an ethical reason not to. And so our brain goes in search of those ethical reasons. And it often lands on one of two excuses, either the sciencey sounding excuse. Oh, it's not real. The scientists don't know what they're talking about. They're just lining their pockets to get government grant money. I hear all these objections all the time. <laughs> right. Actually, I made a really ser fun series of videos called global weirding on YouTube that, that go into some of those myths. They are fantastic. I recommend them to oh, our thank listeners. You. Yes. Uh, thanks. I'm actually, we're actually making a, a new final series this week. Oh, good. Good. Yes. Wonderful. It won't be out until later this fall. Yeah. Um, so either we land on the science sounding objections saying that it can't be real, or we land on the religious sounding objections, mm. which we so often hear, which the number one is, well, you know, humans aren't in control. It's God who's in control. So why does this matter? And then we also have, well, the world's going to end anyway. So who cares? And then we have, well, you know, poor people need fossil fuels. How dare you try to take it away from them? Yeah. We have all of these Christian-y sounding objections that when you go to the actual Bible, yep. you don't even have a leg to stand fit. on. Yep. I mean, you know, Genesis 1 says God gave humans responsibility over every living thing on this planet. Mm -hmm. Revelation says God will destroy those who destroy the earth. In Thessalonians, 
people being people 2000 years ago, they were people who were saying the world's going to end anyway. So who cares? They were quitting their jobs, sitting back, putting up their feet on the metaphorical lazy boy chair. And the apostle Paul wrote to them and said, get a job, <laughs> get, <laughs> get to work, family. Yeah. feed the widows and the orphans. Yeah. You don't know when the end is coming, but because you don't know, you have things to do here. And now you don't yeah. just sit back and fold your hands and say, Maranatha, come Lord, come. Right. So, and, and then when we talk about fossil fuels, well, Part of the reason why low-income countries are, are why such a large percentage of people there are in poverty is because they don't have access to the fossil fuels that, that um, fueled our own development 200 years ago. Yep. Right. So saying, oh, why would we invite them to use the same thing? Yeah, of course. It doesn't but, make sense yeah. it, from two perspectives. First of all, it's very patronizing and colonialistic. It's like saying, well, you don't deserve the new technology yet. Yep. You're only at the Model T Ford and the party line telephone stage of development. Uh -huh. So you have to go back and do it the way we did because that's the only way to do it. Right. That's the first perspective. Wow, but the yeah, second yeah. is this. Most of these countries don't have fossil fuels. The few that do, like Nigeria, Brazil, and Venezuela, they're entirely exported for use in rich countries. Yep. They, those, those benefits don't, don't flow back to people in the country with the exception of a few oligarchs, so to speak. Yep. So you're saying to these countries, buy them from us, get into debt to us, use a resource that you don't have yourselves that we have. And that from an economic perspective is not a loving thing to do either. So we see these, these science and religiously sounding objections that I talk about in the book. And it's, it's really interesting to dig into them. But when we go below that, what do we see? We see aversion to solutions. And what's below that? What's the next level down? Fear. Right. Fear that by addressing climate change, we are going to lose something. We are going to lose some aspect of our comfortable lives. We're going to lose something we hold yep. dear. We're going to lose something and we don't want to. So we hang on to it even tighter. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's put a pin in that. I want to come mm -hmm. back to talking about fear and, and whether that's wise or not, or how we should do it. Mm -hmm. But before I want to continue to explore um, solution aversion, because mm -hmm. in my experience, there are some solutions they're happy to explore, mostly individualistic solutions, right? Like I'm willing to recycle or, hey, I'm going to, uh, you know, maybe buy a vehicle that gets slightly better gas mileage. They're open to some solutions. Mm -hmm. But then when it comes to policy solutions, there's strong pushback. What, um, so is that the pattern that you see? That's, that's anecdotal for me. Uh, mm -hmm. and secondarily, can you explain why, what those policies are, um, some of those, you know, cap and trade and carbon pricing policies and why people on the right side of the political spectrum are uncomfortable with them? Yes. So, so what I see often is that people are willing to endorse solutions that don't even require them to do anything. Yes, completely. And yeah. don't, as long as I'm comfortable, I'm willing to put this right. in the recycling bin. And yeah. that they won't change the status quo at all. So the ones yes. I hear people yeah. say is, and this is a form of climate denial too, because if you say it's real, but you propose solutions that won't actually fix the problem, then that's a form of denial as well. Right. right. So the solutions I hear a lot from people um, are, well, what, why don't we just geoengineer the whole planet? Yeah. Why don't we just, you know, mimic the effect of a volcanic eruption and cool the whole planet down? Right. Yeah. That's like given, giving a 100% untested COVID vaccine to every single human on the planet simultaneously. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. I mean, the level of, of hubris required <laughs> to say, oh, there, nothing's going to go wrong. We'll just geoengineer the whole planet to get ourselves out of this problem. We don't even know what the side effects are like. The side effects could be absolutely devastating. Yeah. They could be um, potentially, you know, worst case scenario again, you know, potentially yeah. civilization ending, which climate change will be if we don't address it. Yeah. And they would affect all kinds of things that we don't even think about, like our crop yields and our food and our economy and yeah. our livelihoods. So I often hear people espouse some type of techno solution just because they feel like it doesn't, you know, they don't have to do anything. Yeah, right. Some, you know, some person over here will just push a button and fix the whole thing. And then I also often hear a lot of people espousing nuclear power um, mm -hmm. because they say, oh, well, nuclear power is a technology that's been around for a long time. So I feel comfortable with it, um, especially for people who grew up during the Cold War. It's, it's a strong value they hold because they see nuclear power as being protective of the United States interests during the Cold mm -hmm. War. So mm -hmm. they see it in a positive mm -hmm. light. And they say, well, if we just, you know, if we just switched everything to nuclear power, that would fix the problem. And if we could generate some of our power from, from nuclear safely and cheaply, it's absolutely one of the, one of the solutions in the yep. mix. 
But first of all, the main reason we don't have any more nuclear today than we do, is not because of any policies, it's because it is expensive. It is one of the most expensive ways to generate electricity that we have. Yeah. Today, when solar and wind is actually cheaper than natural gas in large parts of the US, nuclear is the most expensive. In my book, I talk about how the most recent nuclear power plant that they attempted to build in the US, it, it overran its budget so far in the mm. Carolinas that they eventually just filled back in the hole. And the joke was it cost $9 billion to dig a hole and fill it back in. Oh my gosh, really? Well, yeah. I haven't heard about that. Wow. Oh yeah, well, it's, it's in the book. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I must have been sorry. I must have missed oh, that. Oh no, no. Amazing. So, so there are new developments like small modular nuclear reactors that Bill mm. Gates is investing in and some of the US national labs are working on. And there is the potential for it to assist in some areas where they don't have other alternative sources or they need some good background um, uh, power when, you know, when the sun isn't shining or the wind isn't blowing, they don't have batteries. And then long-term investments in nuclear fission, or sorry, nuclear fusion, I should say, which doesn't produce any nuclear waste, that's ongoing in China and in France and the US is contributing to that. But here's the thing, electricity is only part of the problem. Right. So even yeah. if all of our electricity somehow miraculously got to be completely carbon free and we could do it without any nuclear waste in a safe way, we yeah. still have the whole rest of the problem. Right. We still have industry, and, we still have transportation, we still have agriculture and land use, yeah. we still have huge pieces of the pie that have nothing to do with that. So well, yeah. we, we like solutions where we feel like, okay, just push the button and everything's fixed and I have no more responsibility, whether yeah. it's personal solutions like you alluded to or big picture solutions. But the reality is we have to change our economy fundamentally from economy based on fossil fuels to an economy that's based on clean energy. Mm -hmm. How do we do that? First of all, we need to be more efficient. Mm -hmm. We waste so much of the energy we use. We talked earlier about being a true conservative. Yeah. <laughs> we are so wasteful. Yeah. You know, through efficiency alone, the United States could reduce its carbon emissions by 50%. Wow. That's Insane. remarkable. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yep. And we would save money because the cheapest form right. of energy is the energy you don't use. Right. What's another piece of the pie? Converting all our electricity to clean sources of energy that don't produce heat trapping gas emissions. So we're not mm -hmm. burning coal, gas, or oil. Then a third piece of the pie is electrification of things that currently use liquid fossil fuels, mm -hmm. like cars, for example or like a lot of industrial processes. If we could electrify them, then we could use clean electricity instead of using gas, natural gas or petroleum or any type of, of liquid product. Then though, there's some things that we can't electrify because for example, uh, short haul airplane flights, you could electrify with batteries. They carry their batteries with them. Mm -hmm. But the batteries required to fly, you know, a couple of hundred people from one side of the planet to the other, they outweigh what's possible <laughs> for that plane to carry. It's just not yeah. possible. Yeah. And shipping is another area where carrying its own fuel with it, mm -hmm. you have to be able to carry that fuel plus whatever it is that you're shipping. So looking for alternative fuels that are based out of waste products like biofuel, for example, where you're using waste agricultural products that sucked the carbon out of the atmosphere last year, yep. you turn it into jet fuel, you put it back into the airplane, the airplane burns it. Well, that carbon dioxide is, is carbon neutral because it just came out last year and you're putting the same amount back in. Right. So that's another big piece of it. And then we have the whole question of nature-based solutions, which mm -hmm. the Nature Conservancy is very invested in. Mm. There's a hundred times more carbon in the soils and the ecosystems of the world than we humans have produced, mm -hmm. right? You're ecologists, so you must have heard that number before, yep. right? Yep. <laughs> okay, good. So, so by managing our ecosystems, by conserving, by protecting, by restoring, by replanting in some cases, ecosystems that store that carbon, we can actually suck carbon out of the atmosphere. By reducing it and eliminating deforestation, we can prevent extra carbon from going into the atmosphere. And from revamping our industrial agricultural system, which is responsible for about 15% of our global emissions, we can still make sure that we have the food that we need without being so wasteful. Because in rich countries, we waste about 50% of the food that we produce. Yeah. We eat way more red meat than we need to that's even good for us. Yep. Yep. And we use more of the planet's resources per person than in most of the, than in the, all the lower income countries of the world. Right. So 
there's no one silver bullet to fix the climate problem, but there's a lot of silver buckshot. And honestly, I find hope in that diversity because it shows how there's something every single one of us can learn about. There's something every single one of us can do. There's something that every single one of us can connect to based on what our interests or expertise or gifts or talents are. Yep. And if people want to know about that diversity, I encourage them to check out Project Drawdown which mm -hmm. is online at drawdown.org. They have a hundred different solutions to climate change, including nuclear power, including solar energy, including efficiency, but also, <coughs> but also, oops, there was. But also empowering Indigenous people to manage their own lands, educating women and girls in low-income countries, reducing food waste, all kinds of solutions that we can easily see how they would make all of our lives better, not just in the future, but today. Yep, great. Now, I mean, you, I, I love, I love that optimism and your hope and your book just conveys that from beginning to end. And yet you also talk about how um, many climate scientists have a hard time finding hope. Uh, you know, that the news is frequently so bad and uh, that in our communication around this issue, there's this fine line between being so optimistic and people like, oh, great, you know, some, they, they've got this figured out. We don't need to worry about it and being so uh, pessimistic that people feel like there's nothing we can do. How do we, um, I don't know, can, can you elaborate on that? How do we walk that line between conveying the seriousness and yet finding optimism in the solutions that are being proposed? Well, that's exactly why I wrote the book, because the number right. one question that I get from anyone, anywhere, literally anyone I'm talking to, young or old, Christian or not, you know, business, secular, university, North America, yep. Southeast Asia, <laughs> no matter who I've been talking to the last few years, the number one question I get is what gives you hope? And sometimes it's somebody, you know, posing a question after a talk I've given. Sometimes it's someone coming up to me um, after I've been visiting somewhere. Sometimes I'm having coffee with someone or they write me an email that just breaks my heart saying, you know, uh, I wake up in the middle of the night and I clutch my child to my chest and I wonder what have I done bringing a new life into this world? Yes. And yeah. as a mother myself, of course, you know, that absolutely, um, I understand that fear more than anything. Me yes. Too. Yeah. So, so that's why I wrote the book because it is absolutely a fine balance. And here's why it's a balance. If we aren't worried about it, why would we ever want to do anything to fix it? Hmm. Worry is the wellspring of action, as I quote one of my colleagues in the book saying. So a big part of the problem we have today is not overt science denial. The bigger problem we have today is the number of people here in North America who say, yes, climate change is real and it's human caused, but they don't think it matters to them. We think, and this is something called psychological distance. We think, and polling results show this clear as day, that most people think that climate change is real. Most people agree humans are responsible. Most people believe that it will affect future generations. It will affect plants and animals, non-humans. It will affect people who live far away in developing countries on the other side of the world. But then you ask people, do you think it will affect me? And our response drops precipitously. Yeah, right. That's the biggest problem we have. And so because of that, we need to know not only that it's real and it's us, we need to know it is serious. It is here and now. It's affecting you where you live. If you live in Oregon, if you live in Florida, if you live in Minnesota, no matter where you live, I can tell you a way that climate change is already affecting your health, your child, the safety of your home, your local economy, the quality of your water, the ability of farmers in your area to grow food. I can, your infrastructure, your buildings, right. Right. every single one of us is being affected here and now. And that is the first critical piece of information because if we tell people about all the solutions to climate change, but they don't know why it's urgent that we act, they'll be like, okay, that's great. Well, I didn't think it was that important anyways. And now people are fixing it. So no worries. Yep. So <coughs> now I'm coughing too. <laughs> <laughs> Contagious across the Zoom link. So, so the first part is definitely this thing is here and now, and it's urgent. And so because of that, I often get called alarmist or doomers. Right. You know, you're just here to say it's all bad. Yeah. And it is bad. I'm a climate scientist. And the truth is, it's probably worse. 
that right, we're even yeah. telling you. Right. Because we climate scientists tend to hedge our bets. We tend to actually be conservative in the true sense of the word. Yeah. We tend to be conservative. We don't say anything unless we're 99.999% sure. Right. So even though we scientists are really scared about some things, we typically don't even talk about the things we're most scared about because they're the things that are most uncertain in the climate right. system. We've never seen them happen during the whole course of humans on the planet. We mm -hmm. just have some suggestions that maybe in the very distant past it might have happened. And we don't even know what the ramifications were for life at that point. Right. So because because of that, we don't even talk about some of the things that keep us up at night. <laughs> but here's the thing. If, if somebody tells you about a huge existential threat to human civilization as we know it, right. but they don't offer any idea or suggestion on what we can do or what's already being done or how you can get on board, again, our natural human reaction is just to go back to bed and pull the covers up over our head. Right. Yeah. Yep. I mean, if somebody told me that an asteroid was going to hit the planet, I'd be like, well, that's great, but I don't work at NASA. <laughs> I am not a rocket scientist. <laughs> I don't do, I don't do missiles. I don't do, I don't do anything that could help. Yep. So what am I supposed to do? Yep. I'm just going to go back and worry about the things I can do something about, like my child who's not doing so well at school or the conflict I have with somebody at church or, you know, the, the kids soccer team I'm coaching or, you know, the, you know, just keeping my family safe and well during COVID. Yep. So that's why the, the concern part is only half. The yeah. other half is here's what you can do about it. Right. Because it turns out that hope does not come before action. Action breeds hope. Hmm. Hope hmm. comes after we act. Right. So first of all, we're concerned. Concern breeds action. Action leads to hope. Leads to hope. That's great. You know, and in my field, I mean, our fields are related. I'm a conservation biologist, and there's also a lot of really awful news, and it's hard to be excited about anything that we're finding. And um, some people have have suggested that that we need to um, provide what we call structured hope. That that you know every paper should include some notes of optimism in it, uh, mm -hmm. in order to you know give people an idea of of what uh, is is a way out of the mess we've created for ourselves, right? So it's, do you see uh, something like that in climate sciences? Is there any um, incentive to, to sort of poke the, the scientists and say, hey, while you're doing the science, can you also give us some, some windows about what we can do about these issues? I mean, you are wonderfully hopeful. And, and I did find your book so encouraging and kind of excited about all of the solutions people are coming up with. Is that across the field in, in your um, in the atmospheric sciences? Are people just more inclined to just sort of be uh, hopeful, maybe without um, specific cause? That's a good question. And I had not heard yet about that whole idea of, of structured hope into your individual studies. That's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. I can send you the paper if you're interested. But, I uh, would love to see that. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I myself practice what I would call active hope. It's actually a concept that comes from a a philosopher called Joanna Macy. Um, she's mm -hmm. a Buddhist of all things, but I think as Christians, we, we're also called to practice active hope. Um, and I, I go out and I look for reasons to be hopeful. And of course, ultimately, again, our hope is in God. Mm -hmm. But in Romans, it talks about how hope begins with suffering. And suffering mm -hmm. leads to perseverance and perseverance leads to character and character leads to hope. Yeah. And so we're just like, oh, well, that's not the order I thought it happened. And I thought you had good circumstances and then you felt hopeful. <laughs> no, that's not even the way the Bible lays it out. Right. So in the midst of the bad news, I go out and I look for hope of ways that people are making a difference of attitudes that are changing, of actions that are being, being taken, of plans that are being made. And I, I share those with people. But I would say that climate scientists are some of the most observably hopeful people as a group mm. that I know, because we work tirelessly. We spend all of our spare free, and I'm saying free in quotes, our free hours working on the National Climate Assessment or the Intergovernmental yeah. Panel on Climate Change Report that we don't get paid for. It's not even part of our job description or our duties. We just spend every living hour, and I do this myself, getting the word out on social media, writing yeah. op-eds, speaking to church groups and schools and business people. I, all of my colleagues do this at whatever level and wherever they're placed. All of them are so concerned that they're reaching far out beyond the ivory tower to tell people this, it's bad mm -hmm. and it's us, yep. but there are solutions. It is not too late. Yep. 
that's the message climate scientists have. Now, of course, some impacts are already here today and some we can no longer avoid because of the poor choices we've made in the past. It's as if we've been smoking a pack of cigarettes a day for years and even decades and we have some impaired lung capacity. We have a few spots on our lungs. That's already happened. Yeah. But we don't have emphysema. We don't have lung cancer and we're not dead yet. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? It means that our choices, our actions can make a radical difference in our future. And the latest IPCC report, the uh, sixth assessment report, working group one on the science of climate change, came out in August of this year. And even though it was a very dire report, clearly showing and highlighting how climate change is exacerbating extreme weather around the world, how sea levels rising and temperatures are increasing and you know, we'll be fortunate if we can remain below one and a half degrees. Yes, yeah. It was crystal clear that our choices matter. We can make a difference. And if that isn't hope, what is? Yep. As I talk about in the book, hope is not the guaranteed promise of a better future. Hope is a small light at the end of the dark tunnel. Hope is the chance, however right. small, that something we do could possibly make a difference. That's what hope is, and that's what keeps us going, and that is what the science offers. Yeah, that's great. I would also, I would add to that, I, I find hope in community, uh, you oh, know, yes. and, and finding other people that are working on the same problems and concerned about the same things. And so this maybe this is a good time to talk about uh, your work with, with Arosha and the webinar that you're going to be putting on in October, talking about your book. Can you tell us a little bit more about that opportunity and how people can get involved? Absolutely. And I'm so glad you raised that because as I say, the number one thing that we can do, each of us is use our voices to talk about why it matters and how we can be part of fixing this. And then the second thing is find one or more organizations who share your values, mm -hmm. who care about the same things you do for the same reasons you do. Um, follow them on social media, share their content, sign up for their newsletter, ask how you can help, get involved. Um, look for materials you can share at your church, host a webinar where they can come in and talk to your small group. Um, ask them right, if you can close support the them through, there. oh yeah, no worries. Uh, ask them if you can support them through prayer or financially or through doing anything for mm -hmm. them. There's all kinds of levels of involvement that everybody from kids to senior citizens and everybody in between can plug into because we are really designed to function in community. We're not designed to be lone rangers. That's not the image that the Bible uses for us. We are designed to be part of a body where you and I, you know, you have certain abilities and functions. I have certain abilities and functions. Other people have other things they bring to the table. And we function best when we are working together, not trying to fix this by ourselves. Because like you said, that's when you get discouraged. That's when you lose hope. That's when you run out of steam, you run out of energy. There isn't anybody to come alongside you and offer you that arm, that shoulder to lean on, to encourage you. And that really is one of the gifts that we have is to be encouragements to each other, to lift each other up, to help each other over struggles. And that's Again, who we're designed to be and how we're designed to function. So if we don't, if we don't plug in to a body, to a group, to, you know, a network of like-minded people, we're not, we're not, um, we're not at our full potential because yeah. we need each other. We have to depend on each other. Right. Um, and, that, and that's part of the message that runs through our society today is you need to be independent. Strength is independence. Oh, yeah. No, strength is sometimes weakness. Um, and strength yeah. is sometimes being dependent rather than independent. Right. Yeah. So, so how do we do that? Well, obviously our churches are a great place to plug in, but there's also so many really awesome organizations like Arosha where we can plug in and say, hey, you guys are doing amazing work. You're working on conservation around the world, not just in the United States, but you're also educating people. They've got online courses. They've got discussion groups. They're doing a book club on saving us. Yep. So if people are interested, they can go to Arosha USA's website. They can sign up for the book discussion. It's all virtual, so you can do it anywhere you want. Yep. I'll and put links to all this in the, in the um, episode description. Yep. Yes. And then I'm going to be chiming in uh, for one of, if not the last episodes in, in mid-October after people have had the book for a few weeks. Yep. And it's a great way to just talk about these ideas with people. Like, did something kind of spark your interest in the book? Do you want to kind of explore it more? Do you want to try to figure out how it applies to your life? Was there something that, that I talk about that someone does in the book that you might consider doing too? Or does it give you a different idea? This is a great way to sort of start thinking about how every single one of us can help be part of the solution rather than be part of the problem. And in doing so, it's not somehow antithetical to, or even not intersecting with who we are as Christians. Who we are as Christians are new creations who God has created to love others as we've been loved by God, 
to act with power and love and a sound mind rather than being paralyzed by fear and literally to be God's hands and feet in this world. That's who we're created to be. We're created to walk in those good works God has prepared for us. And as I point out today with climate change, you don't have to be an environmentalist or a tree hugger or a liberal to care about climate change. You only have to be a human living on planet earth. And every single one of us listening to this qualify. <laughs> yes. So by definition, we are somebody who cares about it, whether we realize it or not. Yeah. And by definition, it absolutely makes sense for all of us humans to care about it and to advocate for climate action. But how much more for us Christians, if we believe that God has given us responsibility over every living thing on this planet? Yeah, that's wonderful. Well, well said. I, I have uh, one last question I want to um, ask before we sign off. Uh, Disciple Science is a, an organization that is trying to address this tension between science and faith. And you were an astrophysics major in college, and you were raised as a Christian. You were a missionary kid, if I, if I remember correctly, right? So you, you must have been, at least to some degree, comfortable being a scientist and pursuing science in your Christian faith. I wonder if you can just share with us a little bit about that or um, how you... Um, find peace in those two realms and any encouragement you can um, share for those that perhaps are, are wondering how to make their, their faith in Jesus and their interest in science and concern for the planet fit together uh, peaceably. Absolutely. Well, for me, I don't see any fundamental conflict between those. And some, somebody listening might think, well, that's naive, Catherine, haven't you? <laughs> Aren't you aware of all of the conflicts? Of course, yes, I am aware. I'm very aware. But Again, fundamentally, I do not believe there is, and I do not believe there can be a conflict. There may appear to be a conflict. Where does that come from? It comes from our limited understanding and our own interpretation. In some cases, it's our limited understanding or interpretation of the science of what God's created uh, expression is telling us. In some cases, it's our limited interpretation of the Bible. Right. Very limited. That interpretation has changed radically over time. Right. And so with a little humility and a little patience and a little love, sometimes we can reconcile conflicting viewpoints. Sometimes with some more information, we can reconcile them. Sometimes we can't, but we can learn to agree to disagree on some things. And I sort of take comfort in the fact that when we get to heaven, we'll all figure it out. And there'll be a lot of people saying, wow, I was wrong about this or that or the other. <laughs> Amen. Um, but, but this perspective came to me because I was raised not only in a Christian home where my dad is a teacher in a local church, but he was also a science teacher. Mm. Oh, and so, wonderful. yes. So I grew up with the idea that the Bible is God's written word, as we all believe, mm -hmm. and nature or creation is God's expressed word. Mm. And if we truly believe that God created this incredible universe that we live in, which most of us as Christians would say, yes, we do believe. In fact, I would say all of us as Christians believe that. <laughs> yeah. If we truly believe that God created the universe and this planet and all the species on it, then what is science other than studying God's creation? Yeah. Just like theology is studying the Bible. Right. So how could, how could nature, creation, the universe possibly conflict with the Bible if the same person created them? Yep. So again, where does that perceived conflict come in? It comes in with us, with our incomplete understanding, with our assumptions and with our cultural lenses and with our arrogance and sometimes in pride that we yeah. know what's best. Yeah. And instead, again, what if we thought, well, if we believe they all come from the same place, they've got to agree. If they don't agree, it's because I just don't know enough. And if I don't know enough, maybe I could be a little patient. Maybe I could be a little humble. Mm -hmm. Maybe I could be a little less dogmatic, a little less judgmental. When people say things that I don't necessarily agree with them on, maybe I could be a little bit more loving and more accepting. Maybe I could be one of those people that Jesus talks about when he's talking to his disciples in the book of John. I could be one of those Christians who is actually recognized by what? Not by how they stood up for whether or not my school teaches evolution or, or climate change <laughs> and fought tooth and nail against what God's creation is right. telling us, but maybe I could be recognized as one of those people who loves others. Yeah. And that, Jesus says, is how we are to be recognized. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Catherine, it has been such a treat to have you on. The book is Saving Us. If anybody is struggling with their anxiety about climate change, if they are looking for a community of people that are uh, like-minded, if they are looking for reasons to be optimistic, this is a fantastic place to start. I thoroughly enjoyed the book and speaking with you today. Thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, we hope to have you back on again someday when the next book comes out. Absolutely. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, Catherine. 
Thanks for listening to the Disciple Science Podcast. At Disciple Science, we believe that integrating science with Christian faith can inspire a fuller knowledge of God. We produce this podcast and our videos to help you connect with God through God's creation. We are a crowd-funded nonprofit. We're based in St. Paul, Minnesota. If you want to support us, you can give at patreon.com. As always, I want to thank Caleb Davis for producing this episode, for composing our theme music. I'm Dale Gentry. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk again soon.